Hey guys, it's Cav here. This is the video on Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne. I know that um, Poe spent a lot of time in Baltimore and Philadelphia, but he was born in Boston. So, hence the hat. Also, excuse me, throw a ball for my doll, my dog, my doll, my dog. Also, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne is from Salem, which is very close to Boston. All right, so here we go. Edgar Allan Poe was born in 1809 in Boston, Massachusetts. His parents were actors. However, by the time he was three, his father had left and his mother had died of tuberculosis. He was taken in by John Allen um, and his wife. He did not get along well with Mr. Allen. Uh, Mr. Allen sent him to school and didn't give him enough money with the assumption that Poe would be able to work. Um, Edgar Allan Poe decided to earn some money. He was going to operate some gambling tables out of his dorm. His dorm. Um, that did not go well and he was expelled. Um, he probably would have been uh, kicked out by the Allens, except I, they weren't related, but he was like his uncle. Um, but... He got along really well with his adopted mother. Um, she passed away, and Poe decided uh, he was out of school, so he joins the military, um, was involved in the military for a while, decided he was done with the military. He was writing. He published his first book of poetry while he was there in the military. Um, he got out, decided he wanted to go to West Point, got accepted into West Point, decided he didn't want to go to West Point, and proceeded to do whatever he could to get expelled, which is a court martial. So he got kicked out of West Point, which is what he wanted anyway. Um, his first book of poems was published in 1831. He didn't get a lot of success. Um, his poetry was not that popular, so he really focused on short stories. In 1833, he actually won a contest with a short story called MS found in a bottle. Edgar Allan Poe is known for his horror, but he actually wrote a lot of adventure stories. A lot of stories about boats. There were a couple stories about hot air balloons called dirigibles and traveling around the world. He wrote, he did a lot of um, book reviews. He really revolutionized the way that we write. He was a big fan, even though you read a chunk of Poe and Cask of Amontillado. Um, Poe's big thing was, if you could say it in four, four words, why would you say it in eight? So Poe's big thing was basically condensing all of the very wordy people that had gone before him. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, you can't really tell that from reading Poe today, but after you read other people who were writing around the same time as Poe, you can kind of see where that falls. Um, now Poe was also a really he was a great critiquer. He wrote a lot for folks about different things. Um, about different works. Some people really didn't like him though. And one of those people was actually his editor, which is uh, awkward. So they hated each other. Um, and after Poe died, that was the person who got all of the rights to Poe's work. He also wrote a biography about Poe. So for a long time, all of the Poe estate and all of the works by Edgar Allan Poe were controlled by someone who really despised him, which is awkward. And so everyone always believed horrible things about Edgar Allan Poe and his life. There were some horrible things, and we're going to put a pin in that. We're going to get to that. All right, Poe also um, had problems with alcohol. Now, according to popular belief, he was a drug addict, but that is not true. That was a lie penned by his enemy. Um, he just simply couldn't handle his booze, um, and he didn't, not even a lot. He just couldn't handle a little bit of alcohol, and he drank when he was depressed, and that was quite often because his mother had died, his adopted mother had died. Also, when he was in the military, his fiance left him. So after a while, Poe decides to move to Baltimore. He stayed with an aunt for a while, and while he was there, he found love. Now, it was 1936. He's in his 20s. Um almost 30. He married his cousin. Her name is Virginia. She was 13. Again, I don't have a problem with age gaps. It's just when someone is, when one is 13 and the other one is, you know, uh, 27. That's when I have a bit of an issue. It's the, it's the 13 thing. Um, they were apparently quite happy together. He was working as an editor, but he had barely enough money to support them. And he had a hard time keeping a job because of his drinking problem. 
He published some short stories in the 40s, 1840, titled Tales of the Grotesque and Arabesque. This was appropriate since it was a blend of fine imaginative prose and bizarre distorted occurrences, which happens a lot in Poe's work. Um, now, many people saw Poe as rude, irrational, and irresponsible. People that were closer saw him as to him saw him as gentle, in control of his temper. I know you don't like Poe being a creep and marrying his cousin either. It's my dog. I agree. It's gross. Don't marry your thirteen-year-old cousins. Um. 27 to 13. So that's what, 15? No, 14. Okay, so if you're 14, your your future love is um, a newborn baby, if you're following the Poe logic. If you're 15, they're one. Do you see now why I was a little squeed out? Okay. Um, now, Virginia actually passed away in 1847 from tuberculosis. Um, which is the same disease his mother died of. She got sick in 1841. After this happened, Poe started to drink more, um, and he said he lived in a world of insanity, interrupted by fits of sanity. Uh, things went downhill even more until he died in 1841, which is not a long time. It's kind of interesting. If you look at what Poe wrote and the way that he revolutionized the way that we write today, um, just think of what we could have done if we had more Poe life. But alas and alack. Um, the Baltimore Ravens were actually named after Edgar Allan Poe in his very famous poem, The Raven. Um, more books have been written about Poe than any other writer. Because Poe is what we call a dark romantic. So Poe is what we call a dark romantic. Now the romantics are not people who are like, oh, love, hearts, blah, hearts, stars, horseshoes, okay. Um, the romantics were more about nature and they wrote a lot about human nature and how human nature was related to nature, nature, like plants and trees and, right, okay. Um, <clears throat> Edgar Allan Poe was one of the American romantics. Now there are five major American romantics. Two of them are, we're gonna talk about and two of Three of them we're not gonna really talk about because we got stuff to do. Um, one of the American, so we have the three American romantics, the three types of American romantics, excuse me. The light romantics, the dark romantics, and then like the gray romantics. Um, the gray romantics get lumped into the dark romantics though. So the dark romantics are Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Herman Melville. And their whole thing was that they did not believe that humanity was good at heart. They were like, people are the worst. But Hawthorne and Melville are closer, are a bit more gray because they believed that there was a possibility for humans to be redeemed. Um, we could be okay. Poe was just like, no, humans are just the worst. It's never gonna be okay. It's not, it's never gonna be a good thing. The light romantics are Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And these two guys were like, people are just great and nature is wonderful and we should be self-sufficient and live off the land. And if we had no rules, we would all be fine. <clears throat> um, one of them, Thoreau, wrote this really famous story called Walden where he decides to go to this pond a little bit outside of Boston and he hangs out there for a while and he like grows his own crops, but also his mom brings him food and his friends bring him dinner and he's not that far away from people. And he's like, look, you can live off the land. Watch me grow my beans. It's not, it drives me crazy. But the light romantics are a lot more happy. They're very optimistic about people. The dark romantics and the gray romantics, not so much. Um, <clears throat> Poe's big thing is that Poe sees and focuses on the evil side of humanity. He sees humans as monsters. He's like, we're like the Incredible Hulk. Only we can't control our Hulk side. Basically, man is a monster. There are two people, the beast inside, which are social self-controls, and then the social side that we showed everybody else. But inside our real us is this monster who would like to destroy everything if, had, if they had the chance. Um, when the beast escapes control, the perverse side of humankind takes over. So when that beast escapes control, when we no longer have that social face, it's bad and there's no recovering. Now, Edgar Allan Poe's re poetry reflects this duality that he believes in humanity. He writes romantic poems about beautiful women in idyllic situations like to Helen and Annabelle Lee, but on the other hand, his fiction really examines that monster. Um, 
he's got a story about this guy who really likes this girl's teeth. And so he uh, pulls them out so he can have them all because they're so pretty. She dies. But all of his stories kind of focus on that terror and that evil that lurks inside all of our souls. It should sound very familiar. It's very similar to William Golding's philosophy on life and people. Um, Poe is also what we call a surrealist. So his fiction explores minds and they're loosely structured. So most of his stories are very loosely structured. They're what we call stream of conscious. It's like he just woke up from a dream and went, oh my gosh, this was weird. I gotta write this down. Um, and a lot of them don't make logical sense. A lot of people believe that he uh, wrote these from um, memory, that he actually had these crazy dreams and wrote them as a result of that. It's okay. I was reaching for my water bottle and I spilled. It's okay, we got this. Let's try a new setup for my camera. It's been working okay. Poe has also been called the father of modern horror. Um, all the stories, modern stories, in the American literary tradition and films come from Edgar Allan Poe. Stephen King, Alfred Hitchcock, other writers of modern horror trace their influence back to Poe. Stephen King also includes Lord of the Flies, which is interesting. I mean, valid, but uh, makes me reconsider my reading choices. Um, and Grandma Poe was also kind of obsessed with premature burial. Fall of the House of Usher and the premature burial deal with this theme. theme. He shows people fighting themselves in the slaying of conscience in William Wilson. Um, he also wrote one of the first detective stories in America. Um, originated the detective story. He's pretty close to the same time as Arthur Conan Doyle. Like, they're, they're all buddies. All the detectives are writing at the same time. Also, now modern science has kind of, modern science, modern society has kind of gotten used to the idea that there were actually a lot of talented women writing at this time. Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little, Woman, Little Women, was actually one of the dark romantics. She's just not listed among the big ones because she was a lady. And we can't be listed ladies. And they're kind of their own class because they were doing their own thing. And the guys were like, that's a really good idea. We should, we should do that. Um, so his stories, the detective genre stories are The Purloin Letter, Murders of the Rue Morgue. Um, other stories include The Gold Bug, The Pit and the Pendulum, and Mask of the Red Death. Most were written in first person. And some of the critics saw Poe as the narrator. As a literary critic, critic, he wrote a lot about how to write. His idea of the perfect shoot, short story was to shoot for a single effect. Um, basically, you're going for one point, one purpose, that's what you're after. Before him, people were really not writing well-crafted short stories. It was kind of a, a low art. And Poe was like, no, no, it doesn't have to be a low art. You just have to, you know, do it well. Um, he was widely admired for his ability to create an attention-grabbing effect in the fewest words necessary. And Poe was totally out of his time. This was a time when society and people were genteel, wholesome, and useful. And Poe was not one of any of those things. He dealt with human behavior and his works still have relevance today for that reason. Another interesting thing about Poe is his death. This is a long video and I'm sorry, but also not really. A girl in Poe's death is fascinating and there's a lot of discussion about it today. Um, mostly because no one really knows how Poe died. There's a couple of theories. One theory is that he was murdered by the brothers of his first fiance, who was very apologetic. They'd split up and was like, I do want to marry you, Poe. And her brothers were apparently not pleased by this because he'd married his 13 year old cousin and they were like, hey, no. Um, other theories include that Poe was um, poisoned. He had a lot of enemies. He was a critic. A lot of people don't like being criticized. He also um, was potentially bitten by a rabid raccoon and got rabies. Also, there was a practice back then for voting. What you would do is you would have a whole bunch of different outfits and you would find some dude, some poor kid on, some poor guy on the streets, and you would dress him up in different outfits, give him a drink, and send him in to vote. And then he would wait for him and he'd change his outfit and send him back in. Super illegal. Um, but because Poe had such a low tolerance for alcohol, it's possible that he got alcohol poisoning because he was being made to commit fraud. Um, all they know is they found him on a park, he was mumbling, um, calling the name of the police chief, and then he died not long after that. There was also a dude who, or a lady, who would go to his grave every so often on his, every year on his birthday and leave, like, 
a glass of wine and some books and like raven themed things. They called him the Poe Toaster. And he would sneak into the cemetery and like leave gifts for Poe on his grave. So there's that. Um, a girl and Poe though really did revolutionize how English was, how writing was done in America. Quick note on premature burials. Um, that was actually very common. There were a lot of things, not necessarily at this time, we'd mostly figured out a way around that, but it was a very pop, very common in the medieval years. So what that was all about was people would often drink out of cups with lead. And lead poisoning after time will cause you to look like you're dead, especially if you don't know much about pulses and things. So what would happen is someone would pass out at the table and everyone would just wait because for a long time they would be like, oh, dead, and they would bury this person. But then what would happen is that person would wake up in three to four days and be trapped inside a coffin. So when they were getting more coffins for the plague, which hit a little after this, um, they kept finding claw marks, scratch marks on the inside of coffins from people who were buried alive and were trying to get out. So they were like, okay, so this is this lead poisoning thing, so, or whatever. Something is causing these people to just pass out at dinner. So we're just going to leave them there for three to four days. Which means, in three to four days, they either would wake up, just completely carry on their sentence where they were, or they would be dead and start to stink. Um, the other thing that they would do is they would bury people with bells, a little string. So if you were buried alive, you could ring your little bell, which means there was some poor sap whose job it was to hang out in cemeteries and listen for bells and then go and undig, bury, um, uncover folks who had been buried alive. Which, uh, all right, that's a thing. It must be the creepiest job ever. I want you to imagine that. Like, close your eyes and think about that. You're just sitting there drinking your coffee, and all of a sudden you hear this bell, and there's another bell. And if you don't get to that bell soon and unbury that person, they will die, and it will be your fault. Sometimes the strings just broke, and no one could get to them because they couldn't actually ring the bell. So that was a thing that Poe was fascinated with, and he writes about that a lot. People bursting out of coffins, people being buried alive, people discovering they've been buried alive. It's a thing that he's kind of... Uh, very interested in, which I get. It's a fascinating thing. Um, someone asked too once why they didn't just put them somewhere else. Like why didn't they just bury these folks in a different place so they could pop out of their coffin later? And the reason for that, there were two reasons. First of all, vampires. You didn't want a vampire to just pop out of the ground. That would not be good. And secondly, um, medical students were stealing bodies so they could do science experiments. They were stealing cadavers. And so you didn't want your bodies to be stolen by those unscrupulous doctors trying to learn about human anatomy. So that's Edgar Allan Poe. We're going to be reading two stories by him, The Telltale Heart and The Black Cat. that are a lot of fun. We're going to listen to some clips of Annabelle Lee, The Raven, and also we're going to watch a short video on the fall of the House of Usher and talk about that. It'll be a lot of fun. Poe is delightful. He's creepy and deranged. But also there's something about him that's just, I don't know. Poe's also obsessed with unreliable narrators, and we will talk about that uh, coming up here. If you're online, I'll have a post specifically for you when we talk about unreliable narrators. So, all right, guys, have a wonderful day. Cab out.